I work with the National Phenology Network. I'm based out of Salem, Massachusetts, um, and I'm going to share a little bit about what we've figured out in terms of uh, phenology and data and tools to support invasive species management. Um, so, right, exploring this question today, how can phenological information support primarily terrestrial invasive species management? We've, we're really pretty focused on terrestrial systems, um, but, you know, there's the possibility that the, the tools could be extended or helpful in aquatic systems. Um, I'm hoping to learn from you to make these tools more relevant, um, and I hope that you have the chance to shape our direction and learn about potentially useful tools. So I'll start with a little bit about what the phenology network is and what we're up to, um, some tools to support invasive species phenology, some examples of those tools in use, and where we're thinking about going from here. So the phenology network basically exists to collect, store, and share phenology data and information. We've been around since about 2007. We work with a pretty wide network of partners across the country. Um, to engage people both in monitoring and data collection, um, as well as researchers um, in data use. So we're looking to inform management, advance science, and communicate and connect. And so where I thought I maybe I'd start a little bit with like where we're at in this informed management realm. The staff of the network, there's, um, you know, we have some IT staff and some focused education outreach staff, um, but then there's maybe four or five of us who are sort of find ourselves in between um, researchers, tool developers, and communicators. You know, we've done some scientific publications, some development of new data products, um, and we're currently, that group of us are um, pretty focused on understanding what the big questions are in management and how people are um, working, as well as on knowledge co-production, so working more closely with people um, rather than just developing a tool, because we think it's cool developing it because there's a real need that it serves. Um, and we've decided to start by focusing just based on where our staff is based in the southwest and the northeast, um, and on these four topics, invasives, restoration, migration, and human health. And in this work, we're definitely collaborating with the Northeast and Southwest Climate Science Centers. And that's sort of how I got connected with this group was um, I did a workshop with the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center back in July. and um, Carrie was there and kind of made the connection with this group. So the tools that we've developed so far um, center sort of in two areas, like observational and modeled data. So we have our observational data collection tool, which is Nature's Notebook. Um, it's a system with standardized protocols that enables uh, people across the country to collect data on about 1,200 species of plants and animals maybe like a few dozen of which are invasive species. Um, we have so far 14 million records. Of, so this would be like, yes, I saw leaf out on this species on this date um, at, at 10,000 sites um, across the country. We have targeted campaigns as well on a limited, maybe a dozen species where we are really trying to focus observer effort um, on leaf out in maples, oaks, and poplars, for example. Um, we also have a visualization tool which allows you to explore that um, phenology data collected on the ground. So um, you can look at where uh, data is available at different sites. You, we have these phenology calendars which allow you to look at when people saw open flowers for these three different species um, in 2018. The graphing tool that allows you to compare, you know, the onset of leafing with latitude or temperature and um, these activity curves that would allow you to compare like two phenophases, you know, is um, our maples leafing out sooner than oaks or sooner than aspens in this case. And then the second suite of products are these phenology models and forecasts. And so we've realized that while we're doing a decent job of getting data collected across the country, there's so many gaps, and um, if we were able to process climate data in a way that is relevant to the timing of plant animal life cycle events, we could um, provide a service to the community. So we have started to produce these daily 
accumulated temperature maps and anomalies, you know, how many more or fewer degree days are we seeing this year versus prior years. Um, and then we have a spring index, which is uh, basically an average of lilac and honeysuckle leaf out dates um, predicted by climate, um, by growing degree days and warm cells. And so you can see, you know, what, what day did spring arrive this year? How does that compare to long-term average? And then our most recent set of products that we're kind of piloting are these phenoforecasts you know, forecasts where we take a known growing degree day threshold from the literature, like Emerald Ash Borer appears at 450, adults appear at 450 growing degree days, um, and making that available as a, a five-day forecast. So it's basically just a different way of processing or displaying the accumulated growing degree day map. Um, so those are the tools that we have. Um, I'll just give a few examples of how those have um, are being used so far uh, in different parts of the country and different uh, management questions. So the first one is in planning field work. Um, you might want to have your monitoring timed before leaf out um, because you want to catch that negative data. You want to say it wasn't in leaf on April 10th and it was in leaf on April 20th. Um, and so you want to know when monitoring should begin. And so to do that, folks are using, folks at NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network, are using our accumulated growing degree day map, um, like the current year and the prior year, to together with their field notes to decide when, when they should go out. Is, is it warmer in this location this year, you know, in a way, warmer in terms of growing degree days um, than it was in prior years? And so should we be going out sooner or later than we did last year? Um, there's, we're also doing um, a project with uh, Hemlock Lily Adelgid. This is where you want the eventual release of the biocontrol time to egg and nymph activity. Um, and so the big question is when are HWA life stages present? And this is a data collection campaign using Nature's Notebook. Um, and it's guided by these forecasted growing degree day windows. And we're collaborating on this with the New York State Hemlock Initiative and the New York Phenology Project. So. Um, for this project, we created maps that show just different growing degree day bins um, that guide observers like when they should look for eggs or nymphs. Um, and as a side note to this project, I thought I'd just mention the New York Phenology Project um, in case it's not on your radar already. This is one of the more well-organized um, like kind of regional implementations of Nature's Notebook. And so there's um, groups across um, the state collecting data using nature's notebooks. Some, some of them are focused on pollinators, um, but there are, I put the invasive species that are priority species um, for those groups as well, um, and contact and website there um, in case it makes sense to connect. Um, another example of a tool in use is with um, Emerald Ash Borer, where one of the perhaps lesser used controls is to spray um, before adults reproduce. And so the question is, when are adults active? Um, and the data or tool is the accumulated growing degree day model, which we, was available in the literature, and that was used to create the pheno forecast map. So you can see in the legend at 0 to 350, it's not approaching the treatment window. 350 to 450, it's approaching 451 to 1500. Um, is in the treatment window for spraying adults, and then after that, it's passed. Um, and this is for the map I'm showing is from July 12th. Um, so these are available both like real time for today and six days into the future. Um, and we've gotten good feedback. I think we'll be changing these to not name the treatment window since that's not really the business we're in, but more to name the life stage, so active adults, and to make it a little more granular. So it wouldn't just be that big. It would be like the beginning of adults active um, to the peak and the end, um, breaking up that, that large uh, bin in the middle there. Um, and then there's a couple examples where folks are, rather than using the gridded or modeled products, they're using um, Nature's Notebook directly. Um, out on Midway Atoll, they're trying to control golden crown beard before the before it produces seeds, and they basically nearly eradicated it. Just there's just a few patches left, and but they're spread apart, and so they're figuring out how often should they go visit these patches. Um, and so they're, they collected data 
using nature's notebook, plotted it using the phonology calendars, um, and then we're able to identify the minimum number of days between leaves and recent uh, um, fruit or seed drop. And so that turns into the minimum um, number of days between uh, visits to the site. And then there, another project sim that uses the product similarly in the Southwest where um, flooding is timed to spread native rather than invasive seeds. Um, so when do native Rio Grande cottonwood versus Siberian elm release seeds? Um, and so they're again collecting new data and looking at it using our phenology calendars um, to see when those two seed releases happen so that they're um, better able to time the flooding. With, that's with um, Valle de Oro National Wildlife Refuge. And then back here in the Northeast, um, we're working on a project that's maybe a little bit different where um, the link with the link between phenology and management is um, focused on the fact that many native shrubs are able to have more flexible phenology and so they're able to leaf out earlier during an early spring and outcompete native species. Um, and so what's the impact? This is a researcher at Penn State, Aaron Maynard, looking at the impact of earlier shrub leaf out on forest floor organisms. Um, and here we have like a joint campaign with Aaron. Um, where, our native, where our Nature's Notebook observers are looking at invasive and native shrub phenology and submitting the data, and she's using that as part of her research on the impact of these invaders. Um, and then just kind of stepping back a little bit, those are examples that I just gave are very concrete, um, you know, when when should I go out? Here's, you know, some phenology or synthesized climate information that could tell me something about when to go out. Um, but there's also ways in which I think our data products can be useful in terms of contextual information about how the seasons are changing. Um, so this is an indicator that we um, got in the National Climate Assessment that looks at the start of spring um, based on that lilac honeysuckle model. Um, showing that spring's getting earlier about one day per decade. If you look across, this is just like averaged across the whole United States. Um, and there's a lot of interannual variability, um, but the trend is to a steady, steady moving earlier. Um, then you can blow that apart and look across the whole US, um, how is the timing of spring changing in different places? And so this is a project we recently did with the National Wildlife Refuge System. Um, early SLI means early first leaf index and early FDI, the orange color is early first bloom. And so if a refuge is marked in one of those colors, it means that recent springs are earlier than 95% of historic springs. So I'm um, going back to 1900. So we're seeing, um, particularly in the Northeast, upper Midwest, um, along the West Coast, um, in, in refuges, uh, spring is coming significant um, earlier than, significantly earlier than um, and Alaska, of course, frontier of climate change, um, being earlier, earlier onset of spring. Um, and so that can change lots of things on the ground, you know, monitoring season, management season, um, and uh, have lots of impacts. And so we've also created, to, if you want to look more fine-grained and real-time, this is as the current spring progresses, we produce a map that shows how much earlier or later spring is than the 30 year average, like the 1981 to 2010 30 year average. So you can see how conditions are playing out, both for leaf and bloom. This, is, this map is for leaf, um, how conditions are playing out as the, as the current season progresses, which might provide contextual information that's helpful um, for management. And then um, we also have the potential to support um, more contextual information about species. So this is a case where data collected with NPN, with Nature's Notebook, um, was able to help inform the predicted northern limit of ragweed as of 2050, um, based on where it will have enough time, enough warmth to um, go through its fall cycle and set seed. So, you know, we have the opportunity to provide some contextual, broader information, both about seasons and about species. Um, so the future where, where we're looking to go here is um, supporting 
technology informed management for priority species in the Northeast. Um, sort of building on that meeting that I mentioned in July that was in conjunction with the RISC, the Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Group. Um, so for more species um, and prior species that are important to people, um, figuring out what the link is to phenology. Is there an important phenology management link? Um, researching the available data to support that and then figuring out you know, how we might get the data if it's not available. Um, and, and working closely with managers to iterate and make that all available. Um, those specific phenol forecasts, like the emerald ash borer one that I showed, we're looking at another set of um, seven species to try to make um, forecasts available for for next spring. Um, the main showstopper is that we need to be able to find some kind of growing degree day model for the species. So these are ones other than spotted lanternfly that we've been able to find um, a reasonable growing degree day model. And then we'll add a couple of plants, buffalo grass in the southwest and um, pollen across the country for to kind of inform allergy seasons. And then we're also another future direction is to connect these two sets of products better to use the observational data to validate uh, the forecast. So those are two areas that we're moving forward in. And it would be great to have feedback on this list, whether these species, um, whether the product seems relevant and these species seem like useful species or what else you would suggest that we add. Um, so yeah, the chance I think to collaborate moving forward would be providing feedback on existing tools, suggesting new directions, like working more closely together on a particular problem. Um, and I, listening to your updates and thinking about how much education and outreach is an important piece, maybe there's um, an opportunity for us to to share each other's messages, like in our outreach to observers. Maybe we can, or we could have a webinar on invasive species. Maybe there's some opportunities there, um, and then just some ways that you might connect with us. Other than that. Um, I think I would just be great to I don't know how much time we have, but it'd be great to uh, hear your thoughts and reactions and any questions.